so many pounds of ribs and so many hot dogs and hamburgers. Trying to do it big. We started cooking at about 4, 4.30 that morning. The first two think we did in Government Springs Park. That and was that was around what year? That was in 74. 74? Yeah. Uh, I told uh, uh, Gilbert that she had put that the wrong uh, correction. I had to correct that because it didn't start in 81. That's when the newspaper really started covering it then from that point on. But that's after we, we had suffered <laughs> doing that and we didn't have the right equipment. But after that, I put my mind together, and I, after that, we did the first class because I was a, I was the president, and the field representative. The reason why I was the field representative because I had more connections than any of them had. They all worked here in Enid too. They went to school here in Enid, but I didn't only just work in Enid. I I was in a position downtown, where everybody, the politicians, the the the, 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 the Norman Lamb, he was also officiator for us during you know, football season, uh, high school games. And uh, Leonard Northcutt and Tim Zolodek and Stephen Jones, boy, Mr. Jones, he, they were all wonderful. And when I started going out campaigning for the June team, I'm not even going to say how much they was donating, but they were donating a lot of money. And, and we were able to take that in addition to what we had and make that happen in a, a big way. I mean, we got to where we was feeding almost 4,000 people. People was coming from from all over the United States to the Juneteenth here in Enid. In Oklahoma, they weren't doing the Juneteenth nowhere. Nowhere. Until they started coming to Enid, watching the Super Bowl brothers put it together. And that's where it started. That's how it started. And and if you want to know the reason behind Juneteenth, I can tell you that too. You know, Juneteenth, the 19th of June is special throughout the South and all over Texas. History of the Juneteenth is the fact that when when they signed, when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, saying that all slaves are free, Texas was the only state that they held out on. The people in Texas didn't want them to know, didn't want the slaves to know, so they didn't know. It was one until 18, 1885 when they actually recognized that. And the reason being is because they sent 250 250 uh, troops in the Bay City, Texas, to order that they all uh, uh, release all the slaves in the state of Texas. That's why, and that was on June 19th, and that's where Juneteenth came from. That's what started it. It's because the slaves in Texas didn't didn't get free to two years after that. You know, everybody else was free all over the states, United States, but Texas wasn't. They didn't know the two years later. And then the, 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 they, got, they, 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 they ordered the troops to go down there and just tell them the slave is no longer slavery. They, they're all free. And that's where the Juneteenth come from. And in the colors of Juneteenth, this is one of the colors of, of Juneteenth's history, is red, green, and black. The red represents the suffering and bloodshed of the slavery. And the green represents prosperity. And the black represents Afro, Af, African Americans. And, and a lot of people don't know Juneteenth colors because it wasn't until they just made it a national holiday, federal holiday, that people started really paying attention to Juneteenth. But see, this was my theme when I started it 48 years ago almost, 74. Is what I thought because I had a premonition that I could get it done, and and I and we got it done in a big way. Now, we resolved the Super Bowl brothers because it's only about maybe four or five of them living, and uh, they're not in no condition to do it. When I moved to Dallas, I kept a close eye on them till about 19, uh, 20, uh, 2000, 2002. After that, I told them we need to think about resolving it because we don't have the people and we don't have the personnel. And so we resolved it, and then I think in 2017, Super Bowl Brothers no longer existed, and the Sisters and Brothers with a purpose took it on. Yes. And I, 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 my hat's off to them because they had put went into a situation where it's it's a lot of work involved in that, whether they have it at Government Springs Park or uh, 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 
where they're having it now um, in Southern Heights. I love having it in Government Springs Park because we have a lot of history there. The Mayfay, the, the zoo that used to be there. I was little, used to go to the zoo there, Orange Pool, the picnic areas, the Indian Trail, the slides, all that stuff. See, I was a part of all that coming up, so it's a lot of history there. And everybody thought that my nickname was Spring because of the Super Bowl brother. Actually, I was Spring before I was a Super Bowl brother. And the reason is because I ran track. And the, the, the coach nicknamed me Spring, Springtime, because I was kind of fast out the blocks. And my fellow teammates and everybody got used to calling me Spring, Springtime, Brother Spring, Mr. Spring. And that's where it's Alfred Spring Shannon. <laughs> so that's where it came from. And that's the, that's the start of the June team. You mentioned um, the local community was uh, very helpful uh, when you were organizing. Yes, yes, that very, very helpful. People like Leonard Northcutt, people like Pierce, um, Pierce o Ice, like OT Autry. Yeah, you remember Pierce, um, Pierce uh, uh, Ice Cream business that was here? Pier it's Peerless, Peerless. They had a they had an ice cream company not far from here called Peerless Ice Cream. We I even got them to donate ice cream to all the kids. The you, balloons was donated. I mean, do we, you think that part of that was they knew you from the restaurant? Yes, I, I think that had a lot to do with it because they watched me become who I who I who I was. And I tell you something else that I did for the people here in, in, in the nursing homes. Well, after my mother, my, my first wife, and I lost a daughter six months apart. Within eighteen months, I lost three special people to me. I just built a new home. It wasn't enough, and it was taking a lot out of me not having them here for holidays. I found myself just, you know, just not getting it. And one day, I went to the park one night after work, and it was just more than I could handle. And I didn't want to cry in front of my, my mother. She had cancer. My daughter had to have hip surgery. My wife had discovered cancer. I just went to the park. My daughter had gotten killed in Texas going to school. We don't know who did it, did it to this day. It's a cold case. It was just starting to eat at me. And so one night I got off work. I didn't want nobody. I actually worked every day when that was going on. Nobody knew it till I got ready to leave Enid. They put me on the front page. They put a, did a profile. They interviewed me. Come to Richard's and interview me in the kitchen. On the front page, they had Chef Learn to Survive by Giving Itself. You know what they mean by that? Herman Herman used to run uh, the nursing home up here uh, on uh, Owen Garrett. I forgot what is it called. Uh, it's still there, but the I, I think Herman passed away. No, it was another name. It was another name. Um, Greenbrier. Greenbrier, yeah, Greenbrier. Herman used to be the the, uh, the uh, manager of that nursing home. He was a nice guy. He was one of Richfield's customers there every Sunday. And he said, you know what? I would I would love for you when you, I know you're off on the holidays. But, Chef, I would love for you to come and cook for us one, one holiday, and I will pay you for it. I said, you know what? I will cook for you in that nursing home for nothing. You just get the products, and I'll put it together. And I did. Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, Mother's Day, and Father's Day. And I spent the whole day there preparing a meal. And I told them it's just like giving back. My, my, mother, my mother would be proud of me because some of the people in the nursing home knew me when I was little, a young guy. You know, teachers and things, you know, from the Enid area. So I said, mother would be proud of me because I'm giving back and I'm making her proud. I did it for nothing. When I finished doing that after a year or two, he said, I got to do something for you. I said, just give me a plaque. And he did. He gave me a plaque, and that's what it says on the plaque, you know. But I went to that park that night before that happened, and I, I couldn't hold it no more. I just let it go. And actually, the police came to the park, the Government Spring Park. I just went there and sit on the park picnic bench, and I just couldn't hold back. I had to let out all that, you know, sad as I feel inside so I can carry on. And the police came by, they said, he said, Chef, what you doing down here? I said, man, I just, so that, at one time, he wasn't allowed to be in the park at a certain time of night, and this was like almost nine o'clock. And he stopped, he thought something was wrong, and he came over there. I'm not gonna call the police name, but he was a Caucasian, and he knew me, he knew me real well. He said, Chef, what you went through, I don't think I could've went through that 
and then you go to work every day and smile, and nobody know you've been through what you've been through. That takes a lot of guts to do that. So when, it, when we sat there, he started crying too. And then we got ourselves together. He went his way, and I went my way. He said, be, be sure to uh, stay strong, Chef. When I got relieved in 92, News and Eagles came over and did a, a profile. They put it on the front page, and that's what it read. The heading, it says, Chef learned to survive by giving itself. And, and it told you the story about what I went through, and all the customers, after that, they said, Chef, how did you, how did you come in? You be smiling, you come out, you greet everybody, and you smile. You, you took, it took a lot of men to do that. I said, I found that strength through my mother. So that was uh, a real important time for me then, and, and that's what made me want to keep pushing. It seems like throughout your life, as we've talked about your life here today, um, in almost every role you've had, uh, one of the traits uh, has been you, you've gra gravitated toward success, leadership. Leadership. Uh, you, you know, you, you were... Uh, when you were 13 and 14, you were taking on more responsibility in different roles and, and jobs. When you were, um, uh, you know, when you were, uh, you know, working in uh, Texas, uh, you know, it's okay. Give me that role on top of what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, when you're organizing the Juneteenth, you're okay. Not only will I be a part of this program, but uh, let me help talk to people I know, let me uh, try to help organize it, let me help do this. Um, and so, um, where do you think that came from in your own life? Do you think it was from um, your mentors? Do you think it was from your parents? Do you think it was from people around you, that um, your teachers, things like that? Where do you think, or just something inside you? All of it, all the above. All of the above. My parents, my teachers, and Dick Autry. He wouldn't let me be a failure. He always gave me confidence that I could do everything, whatever I want to do, that's what I did. And when I moved to Texas and was chef at the Fairmont and running the sports bar, he was very proud of me. I'd come back. And I run into him at Big Mar Big Country Meat Market sometime, him and his wife. He's passed away now, but he actually sold a place when he, he knew I was leaving because we had a bun, and he trusted me. I would open the restaurant up, take the deposit to the bank, go get it the next morning at the bank, Central National, and bring it back in, give it to the cashier, and open it up again. I would do that sometime 10, 12 days because he would go overseas on vacation. And he called me Big A. He said, Big A, chef, how are you business? And the people that were younger, that were older than me, when I first started started cooking, I was over them now. I was I was the one in charge, even when he was there. And he would have a meeting before he leave to go out of town, go out of state, out of country. He said, "I want y'all to know, chef chef's gonna be in charge. So anybody that disobey him, I'm gonna have to answer me when I get back, and it won't be nothing nice." And that's how he believed in me, and I, I was strict. I made a couple mistakes hiring some <laughs> top close friends that I thought wanted to work. And then they, they started letting me down. They wasn't showing up. And he looked at me and he said, well, Alfred, chef, what you going to do? And they were Afro-American guys, too. And he said, what you going to do? You hired them. It's a such thing that you don't fire them. Because they're not they're not doing working up to your potential. You don't need them here. If they won't follow your 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 orders, then they're not going to follow mine. And you hired them, so now you got to fire them. And he looked at me and he was serious. And you know what? After that, I had no trouble firing anybody if they wasn't performing and making excuses all the time. Because he, I never did that. 
That's why he put so much trust in me. Where do you think your, uh, two things, where do you think your initial love of, of cooking came from? Was it just watching mom in the kitchen? And, and two, once you got beyond cooking um, under someone, like once, uh, once you were uh, beyond cooking for rituals, once you were running your own show, was it, you know, did you just use some of your old family recipes and that sort of thing? Yes, yes, quite natural. Uh, and, and some of Dick Autry's recipes that he come from uh, Carolina with, that he brought to Enid, Oklahoma, and, and very successful, very successful. Like the macaroni and cheese that he made at Rituals, it was different than any macaroni and cheese in anywhere. And he got it from South Carolina. And you know what he did before I left there? Years before I left there, he sent me to Carolina to meet some of the old Afro-American women that was his mentors in this cafeteria. It was a chain of cafeterias that was called Morrison's Cafeteria in South Carolina. Had the best food in the world. He sent me there to get some experience to, to see where he learned from. He got a lot in, in college. But he got hands-on job, on-the-job training, just like he put me through. But he wanted me to see where he got started at. And I thought that was a blessing. I mean, he, put, he, he invested a lot in me. He did. And everybody knew that him and I was very close. And, and I, uh, I, just, I just respect him for giving me an opportunity at an early age to become the person that I am, even now. I still use some of the things that he taught me in life now. You know, how to address certain things, how to how to react to certain things, how to, you know, just be, uh, just be attentive. And I don't know, it's just, it's just a lot that I learned here in Enid. And, and I've had some good teachers also all of them have passed away that I believed in, that I learned from more than just in books, uh, in real life. And they followed me all the way till I got ready to leave Enid, the ones that were still alive, you know. And uh, I invited them. See, Juneteenth is a black celebration, true enough, where people get confused sometimes. Sometimes. It's a black celebration. But that's where... I had a dream about Martin Luther King come into play. He wasn't trying to separate us from being with Caucasians, Indians, or blacks. In his dream, he said that one day we'll all hold hands and be together. So my thing was when I started Juneteenth here, it meant a lot to me, but I didn't want to to uh, to to hold back where I was raised and the way I was raised. I went to integrated school, so some of my best friends, they were Afro-American. Some of my best friends were Caucasian to this day. And we're still in touch with each other. They think the world of me. So I invited, we invited classmates of some of our classmates. We invited co-workers. They was Caucasians. Dick Autry. Anybody that wanted to come, we invited them because we wanted to share, share with them. And the way they do it now that's up to them. I, I respect what they're doing. But to me, that's not what, what Martin Luther King was really going to when he, when he went through all that, what he went through. When he marched and, and went through all of that, that's not, what he, that's not what he was trying to do. He was trying to get dignity and respect and be treated like any other human being. So the Juneteenth, Make no mistake, it is a black holiday. It's because of the black slaves was free. But to me, like when I started it down here, I started it to have racial harmony and equality. And, and it was successful. And I'm glad I did. And if I do it all over again, I'd do it the same way. I think I'm, I'm glad you did as well. Um, 
I have one more question. Uh, we talked a lot today about uh, leadership, and we've talked a lot today about um, mentors you've had. Uh, I want to ask you um, if if you were to have any words of advice for anyone coming up. Um, uh, whether it was uh, uh, to, to be a chef or maybe for any other business, um, uh, what words of advice or experience would, would you tell them if uh, putting, putting yourself in, in their shoes or, or anything else like that? I mean, since, since you've had a lot of great mentors over the years. Um, you know, to me, honestly, it begins with respect. It begins with respect. And the reason why I say that, you have to respect yourself first and foremost in order to respect someone else. And, and being successful is not easy. But you have to be willing to go that extra yard. It can't be about money. It can't be about none of that. It can, it can only be when you are committed to wanting to be successful. Saying it is easier than, than actually doing it. Anybody that had a career that would tell you that, I don't care what, what field they're in. In order to be successful, you got to work on it. Seem like the young generation, they want to have everything. They want to um, do everything. But some of them don't even respect themselves because they don't respect the person that they're trying to do for. And success, and being successful, it's not possible if you don't have that. that to me, that, that's where it all starts. That's where it all starts. And if you follow that, and my other old school rules that I was raised up by my mother, and being in God's eye, treat people like you want to be treated. You want pe people to treat you good, then you treat them good. You can't have it one way and then you expect them to treat you the other way. You can't be ugly and then expect for them to be, accept you for being kind. In the long run, that's a failure in life. That's a rule that I follow to this day. I treat people the way I want to be treated. I can speak to someone, they don't speak back. My mother told me it didn't matter what they speak or not, you speak to them. And that way, your conscience is clear. And that don't mean, it don't matter what race they are. I speak to everybody. Sometimes they speak back, sometimes they look at the wall instead of looking at me. They hear me, but they look, they'll turn and look that way. I, I, I'll, I spoke to them anyway. One of my jobs also up in Richardson, and I don't know how they seen it, but they seen it for the same company I'm with now. I was a, a concierge. I was the first one you see when you come in and the last one you see when you go out. We had secret agents coming in one day. Uh, they were going to shut down the freeways in that area because the president was coming. Obama was coming. And they did the same thing when Michelle came. And they actually came in and they wanted to know about the building and they also wanted to know um, the personnel, some of the personnel, so and so. I greeted them and I sent them to HR. When they left, HR, they come back to me and said, Officer Shannon, you are a one sharp guy. I, I wish we could have someone in, in, in our field that, that could, could dress like you in your uniform. He said, your boots are shine just like you've been in the military. You been in the military before? I said, no, I just like to look professional. He had told the human resource manager, Emily, he said, he said you know, that officer right there, I am so impressed with. She said, well, you need to tell that to the supervisor. They, everybody just loves Alfred. He's always smiling. He had a tragedy one day. My sister passed away in Tulsa, and nobody never knew it. It was the same method I used when I was here in Indiana. I, I, kept, I stayed on the job. I didn't leave because she was in Tulsa. I knew I'd get to go later on in the week. But my job was still being the concierge. I had to still do my job, and, and I, I smiled at everybody. They didn't even know it until a week or so later. They said, how, how were you able to do that? Through God and the way 
I've been through life. You don't look for you don't look for people to feel sorry for you. If you wanna if you wanna if you wanna continue to be who you are, that too takes work. But you got to be strong and you got to believe that you can do it. And if you don't believe in yourself, you ain't you can't you, you can't do it. So my my path through life, and I'm 72 now, my path through life, I've been going by the same thing. As you listen to me talk, I've been going by the same thing. People learn to respect you more. When they see, that's the real me. It's not like an act or nothing. I love smiling. To me, it's healthy. And, and I'm telling you, it's not a place where I've worked. Here or all over North Texas, that the one thing they're going to tell you, Alfred is always smiling. Whatever is wrong with me, if there's something going on at home or somewhere, it, it, you ain't going to see it. Because to me, that's not being professional. You don't go out in public and look for people to feel sorry for you. You go out to, for them to look at you and, and be look up to you and say, that guy there is really something. Is there anything in your notes that you would like to add or that I, I may much, have not touched on? I pretty much, we probably pretty much went over everything. Um, A lot of stuff I have already memorized. I just put it down just in case. But yeah, we, we pretty much touched on everything. I actually, <laughs> you know, since I was working, I've always been responsible. And uh, this this part we didn't go out, might mention it. I've always been responsible. When I started working, I was buying my own clothes, my own lenses. I've been wearing glasses for 50 some years, but I didn't want to look like a nerd. And the clear, clear glasses, by focus, it make you look like a nerd. And back in those days, they had that line. You couldn't, you had to get them with the line and everything. To me, it was good, but that wasn't cool to me. So I started wearing tinted lens, but they by focus. Like these are by focus. All my glasses are by focus. You would never know it because I, 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 I love the frame. I buy a different, frame, a nice frame that goes with my, with my image. So when I started doing the summer work at Richos, I had. I opened up an account at Colderns. You you from here? You you maybe Colderns? Yes. Colderns clothing store downtown. I had an account at at uh, S and Q's. I had an account at Gray's. I had an account in Zales. And when I wasn't in uniform, I would go to those stores. People that was working there part time. One day I was in Gray's and I was just looking. I didn't I didn't have a you know I had on jeans and a sweatshirt. He kept watching me, and he kept watching me, and and he never did ask me what I needed. He was just watching me, and that's another way where Martin Luther King's speech come in handy when it comes to judging me by the contents of my character, not the color of my skin. He he didn't he didn't know who I was because I wasn't in the uniform. I wasn't in all white uniform like they see me at rituals, and he said, "Sir." Can, do you need anything? Can I help you? He didn't even know I had a count there. But he act like I couldn't afford to be in there. Like, what is he doing in here? The next time I went in there, he couldn't wait, he couldn't wait to wait on me because he talked to the manager of that, that store and he said, that's, that's, that's a chef. He works for here on the, on, on the square. He works at Rich Hills. We all know the chef. He just a one in uniform. That young man is something else. We watched him since he was in junior high school. He's had accounts with us forever. And Zales, I bought three class rings. Two of them got stolen in the locker room. The third one I bought, I just bought it and gave it to my mother. And she said, she said, you something else. I bought class rings when I was in 10th grade because I, I had the money. <laughs> so I bought my class ring when I was in 10th grade. And I knew I was going to graduate. I mean, you know, hey. So I ended up buying three class rings because two of them got stolen in the locker room. And I bought one more. And I said, Mother, I'm going to let you have this one. You keep it. And that's what I did. But I bought all of my Zales. All of this came from Zales Jury. It's over, it's over 50 years old. You'll never see this piece again. 
This came from Tony Orlando. He was one of Zale's top salesmen. He was Italian. He actually bought this over in uh, Egypt and brought it back over here. And I'm the only one. I am the only one that you'll ever see with this. And I've been to the jewelry store of the world in San Juan, Puerto Rico, down in the basement, in the vault. I've been to Maui, in the vault, where they have all the pearls and things. And they said, I've never seen nothing like that. What is that, a, 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 a zodiac sign? But I said, look close to it. They said, well, it looked like somebody, like a pyramid. I said, yeah, it's the slaves working inside the pyramid. That's what it is. It's Egypt, and it rep represents my heritage. You know, in Memphis, I don't know if you've been to Memphis lately, but it's been there for a long time. In Memphis, they have a statue of King Tuck, and it's solid gold. When you fly into Memphis, the, the, the power will take you right over it. But it's right off the freeway. Right off the freeway. But when you're flying in, they'll take you right over that pyramid. They said, there's, to your left is a picture of King Ramsey, and it's gold. Everybody wondered, why does uh, Memphis have a, a statue of King Ramsey? Well, the, the reason is, do you know the reason? Because Memphis is also in Egypt. In Memphis is an Egyptian given name, so it's like a it's like a sister country, you know. A lot of people don't know that, but that's the reason why. And it's really fascinating. I mean, it's something to look at from the sky, and if you ever was driving in there and go, it, it's something to look at. It's it's really remarkable. But uh, even that, I mean, I bought a cluster. This ring right here. People see me on social media. They said, yeah, that's 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 uh, the chef from Enoch. And they said, well, how do you know? I said, because that jewelry that he had on, he had it he had it over 40, 50 years ago. And he's still wearing it. And he said, that ring, that cluster he wears, he's been had that over 50 years. I used to wouldn't wear it. I keep it in the safe at home. My mother told me, if you don't wear it, somebody else will. You need to wear your jewelry. <laughs> so when I was a chef, of course, I didn't wear it because I had to use my fingers a lot. But... Once I stopped being a chef, I wear it. I wear it most of the time. And uh, it took me three years to pay for this thing. Three years. And I'm not even going to say what it's worth now, but it's worth a lot. And, it, and I did, uh, soup, I did uh, uh, security with the Cowboys and stuff like that. And uh, Michael Irvin asked me one day, he said, uh, Mr. Shannon, what Super Bowl did you play in? Because your ring is big as mine. You know, Michael got three Super Bowl rings. You know, they're big, but the diamonds don't show like that. <laughs> you know, it's more it's more uh, uh, solid, uh, and they're silver, they're silver. Uh, this is all solid gold. I'm proud of this because I didn't think I'd ever own nothing like that. I bought my first car off the showroom floor, Yukon, Cutlass Supreme, 442, candy red. Couldn't wait to get back to Enid. I built my first home. All his avenue in Birch, all brick home, four bedroom, when I was 22 years old here in Eden. And that was that was saying that I was devoted and was uh, committed to want to have something in life because I work hard in life. And, and it's, I'm still the same. I haven't changed. When I was working at Rituals, I didn't wear suits out of the store. I had my suits tailor made at Hatfields. That's where I had my tuxedo made when I graduated from high school. I had an eight-piece blue-black satin. When I walked around the Mayfair, everybody said, where did you get that tuxedo from? It wasn't rented. I owned it. I paid for it. Taylor made. Hatfield Taylor used to be right around the corner from Rich Hill. Real convenient for me because it was close enough for me to walk around. i go in there and look at some material. And Mr. Hatfield said, what are you, you going to get today? She said, I need another suit, but I want black pinstripe or something like that. But that Taylor made tuxedo, he loved having that made for me. And it was it was a one of a kind. It was one of a kind. Alfred GQ didn't really come from me, but everybody once they hear by email in the last ten or fifteen years, they say that figures. Alfred GQ, because you've been GQ all your life. And I told him I said I really didn't think of that. I, I, T Mobile. I've been with T Mobile for twenty two years, and when I tried to get my email for the BlackBerry, everything I tried to use. Somebody I already had. So the guy from T-Mobile said, you know what, let's, let's, let's use uh, some initials. And that's the first one he come up with. He said, how about GQ, like the magazine? He said, I bet you probably GQ anyway, where you look. 
I said, well, I had never thought about it like that, but let's see if it works. He said, yeah, let's try it. Alfred GQ at gmail.com. <laughs> and nobody had it. But every time I get my email out or my business cards, whatever, they say, yep. Especially if they're from Enid. They, or they used to live in Enid. He lives somewhere. They know me. Yep, you've been GQ. You've been GQ all the time. <laughs> so we're not surprised. Anybody got a Gmail say GQ is going to be you. That's pretty much it. This has been Alfred Shannon, an oral history on June 17th, 2023.